Rolling sound? Rolling, rolling. Camera rolling. Lubrication. All right. All right. So welcome back to uh, another episode of Are You Mad at Me? Which is uh, uh, wildly appropriate uh, for this time of year. I don't know about you. You're pretty easy going all the time, but uh, I feel like I'm asking it a lot. Which is the theme as an artist? Asking, are you mad at me? I think as an artist, when you, like there's a lot of stages in the creative process where you're like looking around your world and going, are you mad at me? Everybody must be mad at me. It must be it. Anyway. <laughs> so uh, I'm coming into this just, just to give you a little warning. I'm a little grumpy, but I'm very happy to be doing the podcast because this is something that we get to do and we control... Um, what we put in, what we don't put in, and it's really nice to have that creative, uh, it's nice to have an outlet, I gotta tell you. It's nice to have something like, oh, I'm gonna talk about that on a podcast. Oh boy, here it comes. And most of it, like, I got a <laughs> list here today to talk about it, but most of the stuff that I was mad about all week long is like, eh, I'm not gonna bother giving that energy, but it's nice. It's nice to be like, oh man, I'm gonna roast that person. It's good to have a, a compartment to put it in, like, I'm gonna talk about this later, and then... Wait, you wait and see, or... Yeah. yeah. Fives and fives of listening. I'm just kidding. There's actually... I don't know if you've noticed the stats, but it's going. Podcast is going really well. It's going great. We've done this before, as we talked about uh, in the last episode. This isn't our first uh, podcast. Our first one, of course, we got. Um, it's really funny because when you said when you said welcome back, I really was all, uh, waiting for you to say welcome back to the Mulberry Creek Hour. <laughs> yeah, that's our old podcast. We did that a lot. We did a lot of episodes. We did, yeah. yeah. We so did it on the radio, <clears throat> and we did it here in our basement. Yeah, it was a lot of fun, and there's a whole lot of. Uh, uh, episodes and stuff. We got some really great artists on there talking about their creative process and all this. And I think the theme again comes back to, what well, this is. Are you mad at me? Like that. I think that's kind of people don't maybe talk about it very much, but I think that's a pretty common thing. Is like when things are going bad. It's like they must be mad at me. There's no way. Everybody hates me. They're definitely mad at me. <gasps> yeah. Yeah. I don't know if they hate the, or maybe they just want a reason to be mad. I don't <laughs> well, know. Don't but anyway, it's the holiday season. <laughs> da, 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 da. I said there'd be a classic country section. This is it. It's the holiday season. Sympathy. I should have done a song. We really got to learn too. the words to the songs yeah. that we sing on our show. Anyway, welcome back, Josh. It's good to see you. Welcome back. So congratulations are in order. Josh finished another semester at uh, CNA. All done with school for the next month. That's a lot. That's and then a next lot. month, next month is the final semester of the program, and yeah. then I got a six-week uh, work term after that. Which you looking forward to that too? I'm looking forward to it. I'm I'm a, I'm excited, like get, nervous. I get nervous when the endings are on the way. Like I I need to have something else in the hopper, or I get really stressed out about endings. I love it, and I get all you know the all the emotions and all that stuff. Like if I'm doing a show or a play or whatever, and there's a lot of build up to it, like the ending kind of stresses me out. Yeah, finishing something is like, well, what are we going to do next? Yeah. So. Yeah, because it's been like, that's been the thing of like pushing, pushing, pushing to get to the end. And then it's like, oh, they're almost there. So congratulations. It was, uh, I know it's uh, certainly after the age of 40, um, it's probably, it's got to be pretty difficult to be sitting in a classroom of, you know, not to, not to talk about the people in your class or anything, but, you know, having, I've gone back to college uh, a number of times and it's pretty difficult to be sitting next to people who are talking about uh, how their parents aren't doing their laundry or they couldn't get the car this weekend because i think the next the next oldest person to me after me is like 27 and he I, I, it's funny because he he would like be the old guy in the class if it wasn't for me yeah. but it's like uh no i'm gonna yeah because i think i feel like it's a it was it was funny because the other day i was thinking like uh this kid was three when nine eleven happened. Oh my god! <laughs> I know that's a weird. That maybe that's a weird. Uh, I guess you got to You got to kind of got to um, gauge things on like big moments in your life. Where like, were you when that happened? Well, yeah. like I, yeah, because when I was when I was nineteen, I had just joined the military in the U.S. and uh, I just got like to my first duty station the day before on a Monday started work at my first duty station in the military and it was like oh great this huge thing is happening to the country and it's like i'm a terrified i don't know if i was 18 or 19 i think i was eight i was 18 <clears throat> and it was like okay this is terrifying so I anyway n nothing obviously happened to me but um it's it's funny <laughs> it's like the office where were you in 9 11 no 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 but it's it, it, there's they're babies in the in the classes with me like like there's, so, there's one girl that just got out of high school, so she's like 19, and it's like, I, you're I still a teenager. It, it's kind of nice to see that there's still people, you know, being born and youth, being around, you know, all that energy. It's probably good, but I found it very hard to be around um, 
like a, what, little, I think I don't remember the last time I was in school, but I know there was one time when I was pregnant. And, you know, uh, was the advanced maternal age pregnant uh, in a biology class or in a university biology class. And like the stuff that they were talking about was like, oh, it was so gross. It was like about <laughs> eyeballs and ear hammers and, and it was disgusting and I hated it. And I was just sitting there going, you know, just fully pregnant. And uh, and there was these people next to me talking about how their sorority sisters, you know, took their pink switch. Well, it was just like inane. Not to them. I know it's a big deal to them. Yeah. But uh, anyway, I, I found that kind of funny. And of course, when I went to Kean, there was ladies who are looking back. They're the age. There was one lady who was the age I am right now. And she had grown. She had teenagers, which I have now. And she was back learning, uh, you know, and there was another lady. It was just actually there was three or four ladies who were the age I am right now going back to school. And uh, they're they were all lovely. Like they were just so fun. And it was a really fun time. We had a we had a great, it was a really small class. But we were doing uh, office administration. So nothing, it wasn't a creative class. I mean, I got creative in that class because we'd get an assignment like, I remember the last final project was uh, do up a business plan. And it was office administration. And of course, as a secretary, you're not touching anything to do with the management part of things or organizing a business at all. So I didn't take it all that seriously. And of course, I got my comeuppance when I went and did business management at CNA because yeah. I had to do a business plan there. But back at office in office administration, we were really stressed, like, how do we do this? Because we had been learning to file and type. And it was like, I don't... So I... It really reminds me of, like, uh, we just finished watching Mad Men. Like, th- it wasn't was like... It when like Peggy that, like, got promoted? <laughs> just like uh, there's a girl outside to, do, to take care of that. You there's know a girl I mean? for there's that. There's a girl. Where's so, the girl? <laughs> yeah. And I remember there was an instructor in in, in this. Was it, it was all women in, in your program, right? Yeah, completely. Yeah. Uh, but there was a lady, there was an instructor, um, and she said... As a secretary, you're going to know your boss better than his wife knows him. So many things wrong with that. Like, <laughs> it's definitely going to be a dude. He's going to be married. And you're going to know him better than his wife. And I was like, I knew going through the program, this is not the job for me. And I did it for five years <laughs> as a temp. And I'm going to say I had 50 to 60 placements. Now, that is not a typical. <laughs> That's not the That's typical not how experience. That normally goes. <laughs> how it normally goes is you start off with, uh, you know, you get a few placements, try a few places out, and most of the time, org- companies are trying you out. So a lot of people will get offered a permanent position. I did not. I got <laughs> let go or left. Most I'd say, I, if, if I actually was, if I put my resume, if I had an honest resume, it'd be a, it'd be a, pu- it'd be we, I could publish a book. It'd we, be thick. Pu- we publish books. I could, it'd be thick. It'd be a few. There's a lot. And there was, I'm going to say 50 or 60. And that's just as a temp, as a secretary. I've had a lot of jobs. Apparently I have a lot of personality. What would, would you say? You, you have would a lot of agree? personality. I, I like your personality. Well, see, you're among the, you're among the minority <laughs> with that one because <laughs> apparently I have too much personality or the wrong personality or a bad personality. I don't know. But I had a lot of different places where I would have to actually write down on a piece of paper where I was that day. Like, to, so that when I answered the phone, I wouldn't say, hello, Dunder Mifflin, this is, because pe- I, I didn't know from one week to the <laughs> next. Mifflin. And, what, you know, my favorite, my least favorite thing. I don't know what the word is for that. What's the least favorite? There's, there's no word for that, but let's, let's hmm. make one up. I'm going to say, it's my, are you mad at me? Uh, from most of the jobs. <laughs> uh, casual Friday. It was the least thing, the, the worst, the biggest thing that bothered me was i'd be a temp and i, I mean you're nervous and you're getting that's to know a, everybody I think that's a pet peeve is that is that no there's a word anti-favorite what's stronger than pet peeve pet peeve i don't know anti-favorite i like that so but i would so you go all week long and you're you know it was a lot of static and i mean actual static because i was wearing like polyester pants and blouses with business buttons. office office oh, clothes yeah and i really went I, I leaned into it like i really like dressing up and that stuff but it was static yeah, when we met you had like five or six like suits. pant suits <clears throat> yeah 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 and uh and they were staticky like there was actual static so during the day like my hair would be stuck to me and i apparently have sensory <laughs> issues so like my clothes would be stuck to me and when I, I know now if i put on a, a piece of a garment that is staticky i get into a bad mood pretty fast and i'm i've found out that it's because it's the stuff is stuck to me and i'm literally the hairs on my arm and around my body are like literally standing up because of the static electricity so uncomfortable. And I grew up, I didn't know that there was a thing called static guard. Yeah. And we were not allowed to use dryer sheets in my house because everybody had sensitive skin. So I didn't know you could be not staticky. And so my <laughs> whole high school experience, my whole high school experience was static. When I look back, like 
it was like a lot of the frustration I felt was because my clothes were staticky. Anyway, so I'd go in to these jobs and if I lasted till a Friday, I would come in and I'd be sitting there in my staticky clothes going, I can't believe I got till the end of the week. And everybody would be coming in in like really cool t-shirts and jeans. And I'd be like... <laughs> you got to look at Toby's feet all day. Why am I... <laughs> why am I, I, I never had any experiences like the office it was nothing like that and the, that temp story is not the usual but anyway um but i would be like well, i didn't and they're like oh we, we didn't think to tell you like and it was like the reminder <laughs> you're, not on the, you're not on the uh the email snap, chain the snapchat well group, what would it have been chat. then you're not in the myspace group or the email ch- that happens know. at we're talking about Fax chain we're talking about my class at cna they're all the, you know 20 years old and it's all like i i've showed up to class three or four times during the program and it'll be like oh there's no class today because so-and-so had to go get his kid or so-and-so is sick or whatever and it's like why why did i drive across town or well, get the not bus? a small endeavor at this point getting to school is not a small and they're endeavor. like oh it was in the snapchat group chat like i'm not in the snapchat group chat <laughs> nobody emailed me i'm i'm 40 you're not 40 <laughs> you're gonna be 42 in a couple of weeks come on, look at this i mean it's bad enough i'm, I'm getting 40s. older Okay. Early 40s. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt your... No, no, uh, it's so okay. it was quite casual Friday. Go ahead. Everybody's coming in in their t-shirts That was jeans. pretty much the end of the story. It was really... It was that. It was like, what? oh, we just didn't think to tell you. And it was like the, the simplest little human human being, humanitarian move that they could make. There was... And it, it happened a lot. And of course, because I was aware of it, it, the law of attraction, I was aware of it, so it happened more often. And it was like... After five years, I'd say, like, I had a lot of experiences, and I... I mean, I had some really great ones where I got in and learned a whole lot about certain companies, learned some of the companies I did never, ever, I'd never want to work for an engineer ever. Don't want to work for an accountant. They're probably lovely people. I've what do you never... think, what do you think was like the weirdest uh, job that you had during that run of like thousands, hundreds of hundreds and thousands of, te- of temp jobs? <laughs> some hundreds of thousands. <laughs> Uh, the weirdest experience I think was I went to one place that sold like washers and bolts and like uh, 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 pulleys and hoses and stuff like that and uh, they were like when I told them my name they said oh are you related to this person and I went oh yeah she's my cousin so they started treating me like her like we had such a great relationship with her she was so great she was so great and as the day progressed uh, they treated me like they treated her and apparently she was really okay with sexual harassment and inappropriate <laughs> jokes yeah she I, was not you what did i say by the end of the day lunchtime by lunchtime i left i called the temp agency and i said i can't hack it here i can't handle one more comment about my whatever my person oh it was it was bad and they were like oh she was i'm not going to say her name because she is really sweet and i can't imagine she was okay with what they were saying to her um but it was like no that was the weirdest yeah Hmm. but i did have of course that's where i went and did my first gig with a a tv station i was temp yeah i was a temp at um rogers which was yeah it was just had uh, cable nine had just been bought out by rogers so they were like buying everybody uh, jackets and hats and all that stuff and I was there and they gave me a jacket and I was like I'm just a temp and they were, it, they did not treat me like a temp except for at the very end I think I was there for three months it sounds doesn't sound like a long time but as a temp as Vicky Morgan it was a long time it, it, it was, was like run. it was like a real yeah like I almost <laughs> retired from there um but the station <laughs> they manager, gave you a, they gave you a watch when you left I took a watch <laughs> oh yeah it wasn't, it wasn't yours. I didn't uh but when the station manager she was off on leave or whatever and so she came back and she had not seen the delightful person that i am so when she got back she was there for a few weeks and she was like she has this lady vicky has got to go um so what normally would have happened in that position is there was a you it was unionized and they were about to post it so they were trying me out everything was going great but they couldn't make a decision while she wasn't there so um when she came like so the position was available like they just hadn't posted it on the union you know in the within the union and uh so when she very very unceremoniously told me you are done you you can work out the rest of the week but you're done and i started crying and she said why are you crying over a job get you need professional help i was devastated I, well. I loved that job so much and i was such like i had such good friends and i'm still friends with some of them some of the producers that were working there. at the tv station seems like it'd be really cool like I, I, I feel like now it's mostly volunteers that work there but i guess there's some there's people that the time. so and to clarify i wasn't doing anything related to television at the time i was a secretary i was an office administrator sitting at the desk answering phones and like greeting guests as they were coming in and so i saw what they were doing but i didn't get to do any of this gotcha. stuff and so you so were behind the camera doing lights not or... i wasn't even i wasn't allowed to touch any of the gear 
not even close. But you came back later on and did directing but it did, and switching it, it and It certainly did create a spark stuff. because I ended up doing all the jobs like for a very, very even, long time. Even you came, when we came back to Newfoundland, yeah. you worked there and did... Well, I found, I mean, again, I left quite unceremoniously and... Uh, there's that's in the book that's in how to fail a documentary filmmaking so i feel like i'm telling people stuff that they've already heard but so she said you're, you're we don't need your services anymore i'm gonna you're, you can finish out the week if you want and the end of the week happened to be halloween so it wasn't casual friday it was halloween and she gave me the <laughs> option to stay until the end of the week so i did because i really did love the job and i did get professional help she didn't and she needed it but uh <laughs> um so the halloween i went in dressed as a clown and had a big, keep hitting my microphone, sorry to the audio engineer. Uh, I had this big <laughs> smile painted on my face and I had these big flop, I have a size three child size shoe. Um, so I had these big floppy shoes, much bigger than yours. Josh is in like 14s. These were at least <laughs> 18s. So uh, I had these big floppy shoes on and one of the people that were there had asked me to go to lunch on my last day because they were oblivious to how much this this station manager hated me. <laughs> and so I'm sitting at the desk and I'm just, the morning's going along fine. Everything's okay. And they, uh, there was a conversation that happened between the person that had asked me to lunch and the station manager. And she found out that, oh, this might not be good for my career to be seen with the person who's been let go. So she stopped at my desk around 1130 and said, oh, I, I can't go to lunch after all. And I'm like, oh, okay. So I'm sitting there with a huge smile on my face crying literally, literally a smile painted on your face yep and uh i just remember it was at woodgate plaza here in, in newfoundland and uh i just remember walking across that parking lot it's not there anymore there's it's a whole bunch of the brick is there now and it's Toys right next to yeah. yeah there's a whole bunch of other stuff but back in the day it was an office um it was a bunch of office buildings it was like a little strip office, mall yeah it was a strip mall yeah. and uh i just remember walking across that parking lot uh, uh, on a windy day in the big floppy shoes and the sponge nose fell off and it was running, like bouncing down the parking lot. And I had to chase it with the big red floppy shoes. I bet and I that thought, was hilarious to watch. To watch, <laughs> not to live it because it live. was the most humiliating moment of my life up to that point. And that man, really seems like a Curb Your Enthusiasm scene. Like dun, dun, dun. Oh, it 100% <laughs> was. But I, I didn't think, at back then, I didn't feel like there was an audience. Like I, I didn't feel like anyone was in on the joke. I just felt like this is the lowest moment of my life. And it really set the bar for man, I'm going to prove these people wrong. Like it was a real shaper, you know, it was a real um, personality shaper. Core. And so I'm actually grateful to all the people because I learned, I got to see a whole bunch of behind the scenes hockey stuff. Mm. Um, and if I volunteered on productions, I did get to see, like I could go down as a volunteer person. But anyway, after that, shortly after that, <laughs> I, w I did something of uh, note uh, where there were, uh, Rogers was there as the TV crew covering the event. Um, covering the sporting event and I was doing something particularly ridiculous at center ice and I found out from one of the people that they were told in no uncertain terms do not turn the camera towards what Vicky Morgan is doing my name wasn't Morgan back then um, so you can't look it up but how did they how, like if the cameras were there <laughs> so I'm just going to guess this was a hockey game yeah and so there was a host shot there was a shot where the, during the intermissions they would actually have a camera trained on the ice behind the hosts. So they would be talking, talking, talking. And you could see like Buddy the Puffin and you could see the Zamboni going around and all those things. And so they were explicitly told the entire crew of maybe 26 people was told under no circumstances show what's going on in the background during that intermission. And I, I know that for a fact. I know it was a sol because I, I, I was not in the footage and I very good friends with one of the hosts that night so it was pretty funny so that's how that's how so that is one of those times where it's like vicky you're not being paranoid someone was mad at me someone was literally mad at me <laughs> someone was mad at and me. that's okay i know i rub people the right way in a lot of relationships and the wrong way in many <laughs> most others but that's okay there are still people that like me and that find me you know there's a connection delightful that's really sweet but I did. <laughs> I wrote this down because I saw something on uh, my Instagram feed. It's called constructive interference that I want to talk about. Constructive Any idea interference. What that is? <clears throat> Do you know what it is? So it's a. It's this is an. I think it might be an electrical thing or a physics thing or whatever. But I saw it related to a law of attraction thing, and it says that. Okay, so if you're going along at a frequency, and let's like let's say there's a. Is this a sine wave? The one that goes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So let's say I'm thinking a certain way and I'm feeling a certain way. So my frequency is this, right? So if I meet somebody that's on the same frequency, the power of that frequency actually doubles. Okay. Okay. If I meet somebody who's on a different frequency, it cancels out. Okay. 
it has zero power. So I feel like that's that for me gives me like a a, vil, a visual or an analogy of like, oh, that makes sense. It's like I don't even exist. And, so, and it's not that people hmm. get mad. It's that I don't exist. And I, I, it's just I hope that clarifies some stuff for people who are like figuring out, you know, trying to figure out like why are, why does some stuff work and some stuff just so having not. people around you that are are, are on, the same, on the same frequency, the same yep. mindset or or yeah. The perspective, same I frequency, guess, but... same approach to life, same, uh, you know, philosophy. It yeah. it doubles in energy, and of course, the law of attraction is all about attracting things that are similar to how you feel and stuff. So, and if I'm... you have people around you that are that are not feeling the same way you are about things, or or not enjoying the same things you are, or not focused on the same outcomes and goals that you are, then that's definitely going to hinder. Well, it would, it would definitely account for some of the frustration that people feel, I think, when they're trying to do anything creative. Like when you have a brand new idea and you go and tell somebody about it and they go, eh. Or have you thought about doing it this way? Like, no, I thought about doing it the way I just said and I'm really excited about it. Why would you just yeah. anyway? So not the same frequency. And of course, that explains a lot to me because it's like when somebody's on an opposite, like you're up and they're down and they're coming up and you're going down that frequency cancels itself out. So that's, I feel like a lot of creative ideas have died on the cutting room floor. Um, that's not the right analogy for that, but it they've just died before they ever get off the, get out of the boardroom or the yeah. session because it just dies. But in a different room, uh, and then you, this is, I think, why people talk about meeting their people. When you meet people who are of the same, um, just on the same frequency. Yeah. It, it's just, they're just, the timing is the same or whatever. And there's musicians that we've met that are like that who are just, we don't click at all and then there are other <laughs> musicians and it's just like there's music playing in my head when we're talking it's just this is so great and i can hear the songs we'd write together and i like and then actually have instruments in our hands with some of these musicians we've met together at the same time and yeah. it's like oh it's like there's a choir singing behind us it's so amazing <laughs> so anyway that was my what was your question well the constructive uh what do you call it constructive, constructive interference, interference. That, the <clears throat> interference is somebody uh, on the different frequency right is that is that what you mean that interferes no, with... because there's destructive interference. So destructive interference oh, okay, happens when you're on opposite, when you're on a different um, frequency. But constructive, fre see, this is the words, the language got a little tricky for me. Interference meaning like, you know, when there's like electricity going through a line and there's like resistance. Yep. So it's the thing that it doesn't, I don't, the interference might be a misnomer, but this is how it, this is what it is. So it's the interference is... Uh, Something that's not the same, not the original frequency. I'm guessing. I'm just making that up. Hmm. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just riffing at that because I, I would imagine because it's not the interference where it's resistance or pushing back. It's actually. So what I'm I, hearing in, in 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 based on what we were talking about before with your temp job experiences, like if you had had people around you that were, which like at Rogers it seemed like at first you had people around a lot you of people. that <clears throat> were on the yep. same frequency, yep. enjoyed your presence there and wanted yeah. you to stick around and then somebody came in that was actually in charge and well i think like most organ like most places the people who were doing the creative work same wavelength like we wanted to you want to create we so wanted yeah, no, matter, was, no matter if you're creating different yeah. things you want to create something and yeah that makes sense. I, I feel like yeah there's a, like an artistry it seems to be the same frequency so i think when i say that there's music there have been a couple of, and there's only been maybe two musicians that i've met that i didn't like but i feel like they were <laughs> very very focused on something else not the creation part of not it the not making, the actual the yeah it was a little bit more um they just had a, i don't know I don't, I don't even want to speculate but the people at rogers that i got along with really really well were producers people who were making shows and they wanted to make a, something good quality and they got excited about graphics which you know they it was i didn't know the language back then yeah. but like watching it was back when there was like an avid suite with like actual dials and yeah. like a slider like actual mechanical things on the board and i don't know how they did after everything went but uh, so i went when i went to um usm same university as stephen king by the way not the same, same system. Same, same university system. Yeah, that's yeah. fine. Same state. It was pretty close. Same state. Both you Maine graduates. Um, <laughs> and so are you, of course. Uh, when I got there <coughs> and I was, I started off, of course, learning psychology because I wanted to figure out why my life had gone the way it was and it didn't. So, by the way, if you're ever thinking about doing a psychology degree to figure out what went wrong in your life, it's the wrong department. Just go, just go to a counselor. It'll never tell you. No, but it'll never tell you <laughs> what's actually wrong. It'll tell you what's wrong with everybody else, but it won't actually tell you anything about family dynamics or relationship dynamics. Uh, but what I did, so I 
of course, was pregnant. This is in another book, too. When I was pregnant doing the psychology program, um, we had a tragedy during that program and I failed a course um, by this much. And the professor was like, would not let me rewrite the exam. Um, I had a stillborn baby. Not, to, I don't mean to take down the, <laughs> bring the room I don't down. mean to bring the room down, but just to clarify, I had a stillborn baby during that semester. And I think and the I, professor said, if I did it for you, I'd have to do it for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, write that in. Write that down. Stillborn, stillbirth. Yeah, probably going to need another. He said, if you had just not written the exam, it was a final, and I literally got like a sixty-three, and I needed a sixty-five. It wouldn't budge. So, what was my point on that? Oh, you were pregnant. Uh, I don't remember where I was. Doing psychology. You, you yeah. So I had the choice of doing that class again, which was disgusting to start with, because it was all about inner workings of like stuff in your eyes and ears it was it was a sensory psychology that was the, bi- the bio- biology class yeah. yeah it was a psychology yeah psychology uh, biology required for the psych uh degree and it was disgusting and it was all about lab rats and tests they had done on lab on lab rats and it was just vile so i didn't want to sit through it a second time and so the choice was put to me you can take the class again with the same professor or um that was really the only choice that i was given so it's not really a choice at all so i switched and I did a communication. I did a communication and film. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so I ended up doing a lot of film classes. And so I'll also tell you that during the communication program, I figured out most of my life, most of the past of like, oh, it's a communication breakdown. Most of the time, yeah. it's a communication breakdown. It's really not bad people or psychological problems. It's really communication. So that degree helped me. I just condensed down a lot of years of work into one sentence. Uh, but the film stuff... I got to use all the machines and I started volunteering, of course, at, um, what was it called back then? Community, CTN was the Community Television in Network. In Maine. That yeah. was in Portland. Yeah. So when I, I was doing the program, um, I, I guess it was what's called now the Portland Media Center, used to be Community Television Network. And uh, so I started, they had training courses down there. Um, and in addition, I was doing the film courses at USM. University of Southern Maine so I was getting like a full and I was able to produce shows I was able to it was a really good program with you they had tons of equipment you could check out and go do stuff in the community it was so good with the with the tv station the actual film program uh was it was okay yeah we learned a lot but I learned everything I learned in like a semester or two semesters or whatever we'd get in a seminar into two hours at the station because you actually got to do the things and in, in film film schools a lot, there's like a group project. So you don't actually get to touch a camera. You get like a, a um, bel- what's the above the line position or yeah. below the line position. So a lot of times when you're in a group setting and you did some of the film program at CNA, you didn't get to do, you didn't get to make a documentary or get to produce a film or, or even a short film. You worked on some. Yeah, it'd be like, uh, you know, six or eight people working on a, a film and mm-hmm. somebody would have to be the person holding the clacker. Yep. <laughs> so not that any of it's not important, but you don't get to do the stuff. So you're not working the camera. You're not pulling focus. You're not setting up shots. You're not getting to do any of the things. So you're not really learning. But at community TV station, um, and I, this is this is great for our American listeners because they have community TV stations in most uh, towns. Yeah, they were pretty great. They were amazing. And you can you can produce shows and you can put your stuff on the Peg Media uh, website. So a lot of people have access to it. And so we're members, of course, Peg Media members. So it was really great. Um, I don't remember what my point was, but um, there <laughs> um, was a creative people in the station who yeah. made shows and like uh, and seeing that stuff happen. That energy really attracted me. I really felt this is a thing that I would. I mean, I didn't think I would ever touch a camera because uh, I don't know. I was a girl uh i had spent three months not being allowed to touch anything because i was just the secretary i'm putting quotation marks around that because i don't mean to disparage the, the profession that's how that's how yeah. but it was how i was treated right and there were people that like well you can volunteer on a production hang around after work and come down and so i got to i got into the dressing room with a an nhl game i went in i uh, was i mean i was just taking notes and, and holding the, holding the stuff for the for the camera person, but I got into the dressing room and I met Matt Sundin and Ty Domi and Shane Corson and uh, Curtis Joseph, and they were lovely. They were so nice. These are all baseball players? Oh, my God. No. But they were here for an <laughs> exhibition game, and uh, anyway. That was it was, the, it was that really, was really the, great. The Maple Leafs farm team was here. 
Right. Yeah, the St. John's Maple Leafs, of course, were here as a firm, the AHL affiliate of the Toronto Maple Leafs, yeah. and that was a lot that of good years. Awesome. A lot of good years for Vicky during the Maple Leafs years because <laughs> I I loved the games. I loved the level of hockey that was here, and it was like any at any moment any of those players could get called up to the to the big show, and it was exciting because they knew it. And so sometimes they'd come down to like recondition if they got an injury, they'd come down here to be uh, for conditioning, and it was spectacular hockey. We, we went to a few Growlers games. Uh, when we first moved back here a few years ago, mm-hmm. was it Growler's ECHL? ECHL, yeah. Uh, Peter, or Q. Peter, uh, just, might be Q. Peter, our 10 year old, just yesterday was saying, I think we walked past uh, mile one Mary Brown Center now, and, and uh, there was, he said, the Growlers games have to be rigged. It seems like every time we go to a Growlers game, they win. They can't win all the time, they have to be rigged. <laughs> Yeah. So there's the, the conspiracy theory yeah. from our little 10-year-old. I think we might have gone to three games, but... So go Growlers. I mean, the yeah. impression you left with that 10-year-old is that you always win. <laughs> I didn't want to explain the psychology of home games or, you know, how the, the chances of winning at a home game is yeah. probably better because you're in front of people that actually like you and aren't screaming at you. But anyway, I mean, they were a good team. They're not here anymore. I don't even know. Do we have a hockey team anymore? The I think the Rogues is a hockey team, right? No, I don't think so. That's basketball, isn't it? I don't know. Oh, yeah. there was a, No, there's like a senior league now. Oh, like local, hyper local. Uh, so there was a big sign on the embassy that said "Go Caps." So I'm assuming that's. I think they just meant congratulations if you're wearing a hat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Saint John, Saint John, Saint uh, hockey teams. I don't know. We'll have to figure that out. Oh, the Ice Caps? No, that's an old team. No, that's an old team. Didn't have anything to do with any of the Ice Caps. There was no no affiliation. We were moved away during the Ice Caps era, and so I didn't. I don't think I ever saw. It. I think we came home one year. Couldn't afford the tickets. They were sold out or too expensive or I think they were sold out. They were really popular. The Growlers, I don't know if they had quite the same success, but the yeah, Leafs. I don't know. So the Leafs started out down at Memorial Stadium. And so I was, I came in on the very end of that and uh, was there for like the big closing ceremony. And I got like a ceremonial puck. Is it here? Yeah. <clears throat> Look at that. I keep it close by. Uh, night to remember. Uh, closed in 2001. Farewell to St. John's Memorial Stadium. It is now a grocery store, and they kept. They got the jumbo, the jumbotron. I was very happy that they were the like ceiling. when they when they first announced that they were going to turn it into a grocery store. I was very angry because I wanted to keep preserve the you know it was built as a memorial to the you know all the war veterans and all the all the great things that have you know all the great people that served. Um, from Newfoundland and uh, they were going to turn into a grocery store and I was like we, we were all the all the tr- regulars were mad and so they preserved most of the inside of it and um now as a, a much older person <laughs> as a that consumer. grocery store is ridiculous <laughs> there like there's stuff on the second floor and on the first floor and there's a like they they kept like it's just a ridiculous layout for a grocery store and there's all this stuff hanging from the ceiling and it's like if you don't know what it was, it, it's ridiculous. It is not an efficient grocery why, store. Like why, is, why does this look like a basketball court? It's just a, It really a is. Store. And they left a lot of the structure there. Like a lot of the stairs are still yeah. there and a lot of the beams and stuff. Like there used to be obstructed view seats, which were super cheap and I loved it. And all you had to do was lean around. You could see the whole game. Um, but anyway, they anyway, it's a grocery store now. Uh, I don't remember what my point was. Does Say, it, just let us know. If you are listening, just leave a comment. You can remind me every now and then. Just give me a call and let me know what my point was supposed to be. The St. John's Senior Caps is the hockey team that's here now. Mm. So apparently those are really great games. Those, those they get what, really is, what, is senior, what does senior mean in hockey? Isn't that like 28-year-olds instead of 25-year-olds? I think it's after high school. Like you have to be beyond the... I just picture just really old men. I just think they like can in their be, 80s. but I'm, no, I think they're only up going up to like 35. I'm looking at the, the roster most. here, they are so old. I think you just oh boy, can't be. You so can't be. In, you can't be in a league before senior. Like there's a there's a I don't know age thing or qualification or some sort of thing. And there's like and I think there's a cap on how many professional players can actually. There's like, there's only so many ringers they're allowed to there's have. There's a kid on the team that looks like Conan O'Brien as a 13 year old. He's they're they're babies senior. There's some older looking guys on oh, the Oh, I thought you meant really, really old. I think there's a cap. I don't think I've ever seen anybody more than 28 or 29 because they just can't do that to their bodies. S- yeah. Yeah. No, these are babies. So St. John's uh, senior caps. So it's after, so basically after high school, there are leagues you can play in that, you know, up, up until high school, there's like a bantam and I'm talking out of my ass here, but <laughs> like there's, I used to be on the board for the St. John's Junior Hockey. So there's junior hockey up to a certain age, I think like 15 or 16. And then there's 
beyond this, like I think you have to not be in another younger league, and then seniors it's kind of a low. I think it's just an age thing. I think it is the Avalon to... East Senior Hockey League is their league. So I did see uh, when I was uh, we should uh, cut that part because I did not sound very. I was. Uh, <laughs> this is not a professional um, sports uh, talk show. We do not. Uh, have any credentials in sports? This is a dis- disclaimer. Um, I did see that there's lots of family skates, parent and tot skates, and adult skates at Mary Brown Center. Mm. I'm just looking on the event <clears throat> schedule to see what hockey team was playing there. And there's a should, lot of family skating. We should go ice skating. <laughs> sure. I can't. I'm not supposed to say ice skating here. It's just skating. Because if people say skating, they know you're talking about ice what skating. What other kind is there? But when I grew up, if you were going skating, you were going to. Oh man, what was the name of the place? Skateland, Skateland USA, going roller skating. Is so that rollerblading also? Well, yeah, you could have rollerblades there too, but like you had to say, like if you're if you're talking about ice skating, that was a very specific, like. Yeah, no. I'm going ice skating. I think so. You don't have to differentiate if skating is skating with blades on your feet, and I think if if anybody had told me at any point in my life they were going roller skating, I'd be like. Why? That was like the thing to do Why for, do for middle schoolers in the 90s. Roller skating. See, that seems bizarre to me, to put wheels on your feet. Like, that's just asking for a concussion. One time when I was I was in How probably like 6th or 7th grade, I was uh, I was roller skating. And I'm pretty sure, I, I, this is sad, I'm pretty sure I was by myself at Skateland. Oh. You know, it, I wasn't, was there was a, party? a bunch of people party. there, obviously. I wasn't by myself. <laughs> I was just there alone. And uh, it was like dark and they had the lights going and the music and everything. And I... Went around and, and fell. I don't know what I was trying to do, but I fell. And, you know, it wasn't a pleasant experience to fall on the hardwood floor. No. And this kid came up. Uh, do you remember the kid from the Sandlot, the kind of hefty red-haired kid that was like, yeah. he was in a bunch of 90s movies? The kid came up and looked just like him. And he lo- literally stood over me, pointing down at me, laughing. Ha, 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 ha. Like, what an like idiot. Like Nelson Muntz. And then he got it close, like his eyes adjusted to the dark, I guess. And he was like, oh, I thought you were my friend. I'm sorry, and just skated off. <laughs> like he wasn't just laughing at me. He thought you were somebody. He, he thought knew. I was his friend, and his friend fell. So he was like, you know, just like you would do with your friend. But I was like, I'm here by myself, and I fell over, and somebody came Aww. and pointed and laughed, and I'm just gonna go home. I'm sorry, you had that. I think experience. I just I just took my skates off and went home. Um, so yes, ice ice skating is a different. <laughs> ice skating's a little different. I mean, it's still falling on hard ice and all that stuff, but it's just, I don't know, it's different. We did get some new skates for the kids this, this year, so we're yeah. going to have to go, go do some skating. I was, um, not to change the subject, but... There's no subject. We, there's no there's no structure here. Well, we um we did, last week we were talking about the Christmas decorations that got stolen. Mm-hmm. It was a unicorn and a mermaid, mm-hmm. big life-size. They found it. Yeah, it was a Christmas miracle. They, I think we had something to do with that because I think I think people. Were I like, think so. I think people were listening to the podcast and they were like, "We gotta." <laughs> I particularly love the this story. Travesty. The story that they posted about it. I particularly love the quote from the lady who owned the stuff, and she was like, "Well, now I'm in the Christmas spirit." Now that my unicorn and mermaid are back. I, it was, so, it's so, it rang so much with the tradition of Newfoundland. Like <laughs> if you don't have a crisis at Christmas, it's like, I don't know, but I just can't get into the spirit this year. But man, it's almost like people are hungry for a crisis because then they can have like, oh, debt made my Christmas. <laughs> it's like, oh, I just, uh, it's such a quaint little place that just. <laughs> Is it quaint? Oh my God. If you have mental health issues here in Newfoundland, you're a goner. There's like you gotta you really gotta buck the trend to work on your mental health issues in Newfoundland because you were steeped in tradition, and right now everybody's losing their minds like for Christmas or the they, the Salvation Army wasn't going to be allowed into the mall with the kettle campaign. Now, to be so to be clear, they announced that the Salvation Army wouldn't be allowed in next year. This year they were fine. They but they made a rule. They announced it. It was in the news. Next year, we're not going to let them in. And people went bonkers. Now, (laughs) there were some issues because some certain, certain groups of people are not supported by this church, right? And they do great work, but they're also a church and they're also fallible. What's the, is it fallible? Yeah. Not infallible. Uh, They're not perfect. um, And there's lots of other religions that have lots of other events. I mean, I grew up, you know, Christian, Catholic, whatever, celebrating Christmas. But, like, 
being a little more open-minded about stuff, um, people went nuts because the Salvation Army wasn't allowed in the mall. They it's were going to boycott. It's not even Christmas. They were going to boycott the mall. They, I say they, there was just a few angry, like 15 angry people on Facebook to look like. The mall itself or the stores in the mall? No, they were going to boycott. Well, I mean, <laughs> but there was, so there was this great big hallelujah. They decided, that's it. Now the Salvation Army is allowed in there for life. They have a permanent permission to be in there. So they can discriminate against anybody they want <laughs> and they're going to be allowed in the mall to raise money, which, man, cool. it's, I'm going to be blacklisted for that. But whatever, like they do great work, but it was like in the bigger picture of things, it was just, uh, just a ridiculous story. Anyway, yeah. that was in the news. Tell us about your Salvation Army stories in your town. They have been, they like, they've helped us. But we're a straight white that's couple. An, that's another thing that's different in. Was that too? In, was that too controversial to say that? <laughs> so brave, so controversial. No, I don't mean to be brave, but I mean they do great work. But it's also like they also raise hundreds of thousands of dollars, and the the kettle campaign doesn't need to be in the mall. It's not a bit like it was just the focus on. I think what irritates me about it, what makes so someone saying, "Are you mad at these people?" No, I'm not mad at them at all. It's just the pressure to have a good Christmas dinner. Like, I don't know if you know yeah. this or not. I don't know if you own a calendar, but there's 365 <laughs> days, 364 days most years, um, where you need a meal. At, like, children having a good meal and a good experience is important all, all year time. long. Yeah. But the pressure to, like, and it's all, it's global. It's it's wherever Christians are. Um, you got to have a good Christmas dinner. You got to have presents under the tree. And, like, well, they also need shoes and a warm jacket and they need food all year long it's just yeah. the focus is, and thanksgiving i remember in, in the u.s thanksgiving was the big thing that you've got to have a good thanksgiving dinner you can starve to death every other day of the year i don't know you can't help it i know you can't help every single day but there's a lot of pressure it's on a the, lot of pressure to make sure like that you know there's all the trimmings and it's like does that how you normally eat do you usually have eight dishes on the table when you eat every every meal every day every you have meal a huge meal yeah <sighs> Anyway, where were we? We were talking about the uh, the um, unicorn and mermaid that got returned. Hallelujah. We're happy that they got returned. It's a Christmas miracle. Yep. Yeah. So well, I was going to say that in the South, the Salvation Army, when I was growing up, the Salvation Army was just a place that you go to buy cheap clothes. It was just a thrift store, which I, I they the church, the Salvation Army church that's here has a thrift store, but the, I never heard of a Salvation Army church yeah. When I was growing up, but it's really funny because we, you never had you never had contact with that part of it. No, I, and as far as I know, there I don't I don't I'd go so far as to say there wasn't a church. It was just thrift store, <laughs> but like it would have to be right, I guess, because there was that. Would, if they're yeah, if they have. But a we've store. we've had occasion to go to a Salvation Army church a few times since we've been together, and it's so funny to me to see people wearing like military uniforms <laughs> in church. And they're the anyway. It's like God's army. It is God's. And they're you know they're doing God's work. Yeah. <laughs> Salvation Army. It's really we yeah. We were um it's we were downtown done. yesterday that the uh, there was a Christmas market happening at the city hall, and um we decided to go out because it was nice. It was a it was like a super stormy all night long until about four or five o'clock in the morning. Like it felt like the roof was going to blow off the house, and then, the sun and then came it just out. stopped. Yeah. Yeah. So we went downtown to, uh, we walked all the way from our house downtown, which took like a half an hour. We walked to Tim Hortons to get some breakfast, and then we decided to keep on walking and go downtown and, really and go nice. to the market. And uh, we would just get the bus back. We were just going to, we were just going to figure out when the bus was running using our, our amazing technology. So... This is one of those moments where I think Josh was like, are you mad at me? Because I would say, <laughs> when's the next bus coming? And I feel like this is a pretty standard question. Like, everybody knows about that. Because I spent time on the buses, uh, like, many times as a student, uh, not as, like, beyond high school. But as a college student, like, I spent a lot anytime, of time anytime I ride getting the bus. bus routes. So it, it's almost second nature to me. Like, you just put it, like, this will transfer you and a transfer system makes total sense to me. And so I, I was kind of surprised because you're just usually such a capable, strong Anytime I ride the bus, Gentlemen. I make sure it's a one shot. I get on one bus and then I get off of that yeah, same bus happening. where that's I want to be. And if I can't, I'll just get as close to where, where I'm going as I can and just walk the rest of the way because I don't yeah. understand 
how transfers yeah, work. And this is I've what never we figured out. Before. This is what we figured out this weekend. So I would, I was leaving it to him for some reason. I was like, hey, Josh, when's the next bus? And then he was giving me these ridiculous, like, well, we got to walk up to uh, this road and that's about 28 minutes away to meet the bus that's coming in 30 minutes. And I was like, walk 28 minutes. What are you talking about? We're put in our location because it's all digital now. This used to be like on trans, like on, you know, actual pamphlets. And we used to have like fold out the pamphlets to see what route. And I, I guess I memorized all of them. We used to have to telegraph the main office. Okay. That's, that's <laughs> too much. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't that long ago. Um, well, I mean, actually so the, it was 25 ma- years. So the- I'm looking at my husband, my capable, capable, educated, smart husband. And he's going, eh. yeah, we just got to walk up to uh, La Merchant Road from downtown, which is all the way up the hills. So St. John's, of course, is nestled in a... In the, in, the in the valley of a cliff, uh, everything was built on these hills, and so to get up those hills is like what? This is why you need vehicles. Uh, so he would say in things ridiculous things like that we'd have to walk, and I was like, just where? Where are you looking? He was like, I'm on the Metrobus website. So the Metrobus, we almost got in a fight. <laughs> has a website, and it has a link on there. Plan your route, mm. and plan your route. I'm gonna. That's my accent Localized coming out. <laughs> um, so the it's plain, and so you put in your address, you put in where you want to go, and it was saying like, literally, it was okay. So it was Sunday, so it was a, you know the schedules are a little weird on Sundays, granted, but the it was saying like in three hours the next bus is going to come, and it's going to be a half an hour down the road, up the road, up the hill. So it was like this is ridiculous. Why can't we just get a bus? And I was like, Vicky goes, uh, wh- why are you on the Metro Bus website? Use Google Maps. So you put in your address on Google Maps and say you want to ride the bus, and it gives you the the route, and it's like, oh, it's there's a bus in five minutes. Like Across why, the street. Why is the Metro Bus website not the not the main point of <laughs> getting information well, about the does, buses? Exactly. How does Google have better information <laughs> than the actual corporation that is? Getting I feel like funded. somebody over at Metro Bus was like, eh, don't worry too much about it. Google Maps They'll got us covered. It it's called phoning it in because it's a miserable website. It's miserable. It does and not. As a as like a graphic can, design student, I know that somebody is or has gotten paid to put that together uh-huh. and keep it running. Which can't cost very much because it's bare bones. And wow. Yeah. We did so make it home. One. We we walked yeah. we walked around. There downtown. was many options actually for d- different buses. Like you want to get one in ten minutes, fifteen minutes, twenty minutes, and this was even on Sunday. So this the okay. So to clarify, the Metro Bus system phenomenal like really cheap get you everywhere and it goes to like far flung places now well outside what it used to um you can get a bus to petty harbor yeah but really yeah Ooh, we a, should do that there's a bus nice stop to to I, I, i'm almost positive i saw a bus stop last time we were in petty harbor like you could ride the bus i think someone might have just stolen a sign and put it up on a, <laughs> it was I don't just in their yard unless it's the allen door I'm, tour i'm gonna i was just about to go to metrobus.com but we just Ooh. talked we just talked about this so shout like just a little you know tip of the head to system the, the bosses are great the the website not so great and but you can like you can go to a bus stop and text a number on the, the on the sign and it'll tell you where your bus is which is pretty phenomenal so i guess maybe they put it, all the resources you, into that when the next one's coming yeah yeah i'm looking at the but uh, this bu- this business of like i'm not going to transfer is ridiculous like that's i don't know where he got that he, you're like a direct flight guy like oh i only fly first class so i do know i did learn yesterday how to do transfers so if i need to do it again it's not so scary i just assume this is everybody knows these things so it's kind of a shock sometimes to uh Listen, go, oh you you really don't know the places i grew up didn't have buses yeah i didn't grow up there in the was city now either. to be I, fair and for a couple of years we lived in boone in north carolina where appalachian state university was because my mom was going to school there when i was in high school and they had the apple cart that was the name, and it really sounds like yeah. one guy going around with a wagon. Yeah. But it was like they had, I don't know, maybe they had three or four buses. But that was the, the if the Apple cart was running, school was in session. Did so you have like, to pay for it? Yeah, yeah. It was like a regular bus, bus yeah, okay. system. They just called it the Apple cart because it was an Apple. We'll have to check seat. that out in our travels. I'd like to try that out. I'm sure the boys would love it. Apple cart. Oh, boy. I haven't thought about that in years. But if it snowed... You and you wondered w- whether or not classes were going to happen or school was going to be in or whatever for the high school or the university, if the apple cart was running, school was in. So that was basically the rural Waffle House. If Waffle House is closed, we're in trouble. Yeah, you're not you're not in any trouble until apple cart shuts down. Gotcha. For the, 
I think that's pretty similar to here. Weather. If the Metro bus is still running, it's probably still okay. So it has to be pretty stormy before the bus drivers here will go off the roads. Like, you know, be pulled off the roads. Not, not go, go off the roads. <laughs> they don't go off the roads. <laughs> rarely, very rarely yeah. do they go off the roads. They don't. They actually, it's really, like, it's. I love them. Like, it's always warm. It's, you know, it's an experience. There's the Wi-Fi bus. on them now. Yeah. Which is pretty cool. And cameras. There's cameras watching. I was wrong. Cameras. I can't find a bus that goes out to Petty Harbor. Maybe I was thinking about. Saint I'm pretty Phillip sure someone just nailed a sign. Somebody to just it. took a sign. Yeah. yeah, but it. I mean, it's still not in St. Phillips, unfortunately, and I'm hoping that'll change. It gets out to the overpass, which is barely on the edge of St. Phillips. What overpass? When you're going down. Does it really? Road, yeah. Oh, sure. You can There's just bus walk from of, there. What's that? That um, bus. The bus. So the over. Okay. So when you Gladney's say overpass, the overpass used to be out on. Um, yeah, I'm no, going to say Topps Road, the TCH where the TCH goes over starts. Thorburn Road. Yeah. So, and of course, now the TCH goes over Thorburn Road, so it's a whole different thing. So, past the overpass, there's a few overpasses. Anyway, if you're coming to visit. If you're, yeah. If you're making plans. All right. What else do we got? Let's see. See this. Oh, I got a, I got, I got, uh, so I got in some trouble last week because I was wearing my headphones. So, I got these. Did you just want to have your ears warm? Is that why you... Well, I just thought, I can't actually find any headphones. I think Josh hid them all. I'm going to do some described video. Vicky placed a pair of Christmas-themed earmuffs on her head. (laughs) That's described video for the visually impaired. Oh, you lost your glasses. (sighs) They're useless anyway. I don't know why I'm bothering to get them. (laughs) (laughs) If you don't understand that reference, it's from our first episode, Carmageddon. Vicky didn't didn't want to get bifocals, so she's stuck with glasses that don't work. They work for whoever has this prescription. Just, that's not <laughs> they me. probably work for somebody. They probably improve somebody's eyesight, but not mine. I, I mean, it's getting worse, too, so I'm going to need some. What else we got on our list to talk I got to say, we have one beagle in the room, and he's back here. Very he's my, my the one that's always glued to me. Uh, we have not had any. I got the, so like, the I don't know if you can see from where you're sitting, but I got all the cables tucked under the rug this time. Nice. So none of the dogs got tangled up in it, and there's been no zoomies, no like. Yeah, we prepared. Craziness. We prepared, but didn't need it. So there's a blooper reel from last week's episode called Beagle Zoomies, where all the gear fell over numerous times, and uh, it was pretty funny. It's pretty funny because there's two tripods. Nothing broke. That's why it's funny. There's two tripods in the room. One of them has a big LED softbox light on it, and the other one has the camera on it. They knocked over the LED, which is like the best one they could knock over because it's protected by the softbox. It's LEDs, so they're not going to really break anyway. And the camera, which is more expensive got knocked but it didn't get knocked over it just moved our shot and i was thinking afterwards when i was editing that clip together like i'm really glad they didn't knock the camera over because that would have been worse than the anyway hashtag life with beagles so we've we've got through most of the stuff on our list uh i do have some good news what do you got december 17th you're not gonna like i'm i'm still shocked by this um headlining I got asked a headline. We got some comedy happenings. Yeah. Uh, so I'm headlining Ladies Night at Last Minute Comedy on December 17th. That's at Peter Easton Pub in St. John's, Newfoundland. You and, got some uh, club gigs as well. I'm That's excited what about that. Say. I mean, I was I was floored. Like, of course, we did our we did our own show, and uh, I headlined because we produced the show. <laughs> so, Why not? I mean, this goes right along that thread of, uh, you know, is self-publishing really publishing? Like, are you really an author if you self-published a book? And this is like, are That's you really... just negative self-talk that we don't participate in. Yeah. Or are you really headlining if you if you produce the show? And yeah, 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 you 100% are. But it's pretty nice to get asked, I got to say. So have somebody write to you and say, hey, would you like to headline this show that I'm putting together? Yeah, do the ceremony of it, you know, like <laughs> yeah. send an email and say, uh, hey, Vicky, and we'll be sitting across from each other. But, you know, we'll, that's a really good idea because in the self-publishing world, um, you get a you get a this is a thing that we've talked your... about a few times where yeah. people who uh, have a dream of, of being a, a published author, uh, the dream seems to include getting that letter from uh, the publisher saying from we Random love House. your <clears throat> or whoever <laughs> uh, we love your book and we're going to publish it. And I feel like some of the details that are missing from that is you have to write the manuscript. And then how are you getting it to people? So this is something that you you write a manuscript and then you see what the next step is. And so for me, the first book I wrote that never got published is upstairs in an envelope somewhere. And it was probably terrible. Uh, but you, where do you deal with it? You can't just send your manuscript to publisher. You have to send query letters. And how do you know where to send it? And how do you know who's accepting? So there's a, I think it's called Publisher's Market. They publish one is like this. It's like three inches thick. 
It's about 30, it used to be $30 when I bought it many years ago. Uh, and it's published every single year. So it's updated and it lists every single magazine, every publication, every publishing house. Um, I don't even know if there's so, stuff in there for books. It was mostly for magazines. But anyway, so you send query letters. So after you write your book, you send a query letter to a publisher saying, I just wrote a book. Here's what it's about. Would you like to publish it? And hopefully, both based on your query letter, Q-U-E-R-Y, um, they might pick up your book or they might ask to see your manuscript. And then you might possibly have to send your manuscript in for them to look at. 90% of them get rejected. Even when you get to that point, you've written your book, you've asked the publisher if they want it, they've requested your manuscript. They turn down 90%. So the then you have a manuscript did. sitting in your in your on your desk that you or, print out or send it digitally, you're whatever. Just waiting for somebody to say right. yes, we'd like to publish that for you. So the dream usually starts with you, you, that stuff is all like, oh, I guess that just happened somewhere. And then the the dream is that you get the letter from the publisher saying we love your book, we want to publish it. And so then uh, they magically you end up on you know in your dream world. You're on a book tour. You're going to signings. You become very famous. You become very wealthy. There's a massive you're check. On Kathy Lee Regis and Kathy Lee. Yeah, doing your yeah. Book that's interview. that's about going back in time a little bit. I don't <laughs> even know who's on there now. Um, there's a book. There's an advance. There's this big, there's this romantic myth of you get this big massive advance when you're a published author. So like you know, there's like Stephen King, J.K. Rowling, and you know the big names that people know, Danielle Steele. They're big names, right? Like they probably do book tours and they probably get massive advances. But for the regular people, now I'm gonna so I'm gonna talk about Canada first. Because, and I say this just as a um, full disclosure, uh, we have self-published NL as our Facebook group, and uh, we help people publish books. So just just as a disclaimer, this is a thing that we are very heavily invested in. Um, the traditional publishing route um, in Canada, if a company, there, so there's publishing houses, and they get a fairly substantial grant from the government to publish X number of a books, amount of books every year. Right. So these companies are are funded by your books. And they so let's say there's a local company that publishes maybe twenty books a year. Okay. So that's more than one every month. Um, they don't do marketing. This is a, another thing that like the romantic idea is I that this company is gonna they love my book, so they're gonna take care of me, they're gonna take me under their wing. Um they're going to set up the book signings. They're going to handle all my fan mail. <laughs> um, they don't do any of that. They don't do marketing. They give you an advance, but it's you have to pay that back. And it's based on 10% of your book sales. So if let's say you get $2,000 and they sell your book for 20 bucks, you have to sell two. How many? Sorry, I don't want to do math. Um, tell me the math. 10%, $20 per book, you get $2 per book. So how many books do you need to sell? It, uh, the math was right in my head. Okay, so 1,000 books. You need to sell 1,000 copies of your book with zero marketing done for you. You had to sell 1,000 copies before you start to make money. So the advance, you that's an advance on sales. People rarely make their advance back. So you actually end up, I don't think you actually have to pay back $400 or $500 or whatever. I don't think they ever come looking for that $2,000 back, but... You rarely make that much money on your book that they've published. Now, they've gotten this massive grant that covers their office rental, their corporate salaries, their marketing budget. There's no marketing budget. They market the company, but not your book. And so you're left with this thing that you don't really own the rights to. And so if there's a just let's just say it's a fiction book and you, there's someone wants to write a they make a movie of it. Your rights are, it's pretty tricky. Like, unless you have a lawyer that worked out your contract, they own the rights to your stuff. It's a big, not, so it's a big company. That not has to their, mention, their own let's start with the very manuscript itself. I'm on a pet, I'm up on a podium up here now or a, a soapbox. But, so let's just talk about your manuscript. Someone else reads it and edits it. And it's not your words anymore. Like, if you wrote a book, you're probably pretty good with English and grammar. I or do, yeah. it sounds just like how you speak, and that's okay, too. That's really good. So an editor taking it and saying, this is not okay, this is not okay, they're rewriting your book. And they can, they'll can they take stuff out. They'll say, you can't put this in. This is a liability. Someone might get mad about this thing. Uh, whatever, whatever. You don't have creative control over your book. Not to say that you're going to make up crazy stories about people and, and slander everybody, but they have creative control. They have creative control over your graphic design, over your book cover, over all the things, over the release date. And your release date is at least a year away. So publishers, if you're listening, 
uh, feel free to correct me on any of this stuff. I'm happy to mm-hmm. debate and I'm happy to give you testimonials and, and stories of actual people. And let's put them all in the same room and compare stories because the actual horror stories of people who think they're going to just make it big because a publishing house published their book is minimal. It, it seems like happen. there's a lot of there's a lot of like the um, stories of people getting like a thirty thousand dollar advance and then but it's like one there's a lot more to it than that. Unless you're a famous person and they've bought the rights to your life story, yeah, and that's a different situation. And so then you just got to make yourself famous. So there's really a route to publishing being successful. But so I'm going to give you some numbers for self publishing and some details for self publishing. You have total creative control over your manuscript. You have total creative control over your graphic design. Your book can go to market as soon as it's done. Like as soon as it's ready to go and you order a draft copy to have a look at it, it can be to market in a couple of months, not next year, not next round or not whatever. It's not going to compete with 20 other, 19 other books that these company has, has mass produced. Um, there's a, and the, the, the rate of, <laughs> okay, so if you go with KDP or Amazon, you might be getting 30% of your sales. You might be getting 70% of your sales. It depends. That's a detail that you work out. However, I just discovered that you can sell your book on your own website. So you spent the past couple of weeks working on a, a website for self-published NL for us mm. through Shopify, mm. which is one of many e-commerce websites. And that's gonna that's hosting our all of our stuff, right? All of it. The so, books that you've written, the CD that we made, the information about this films, podcast. I guess some documentary films on some there. Some film stuff. Yeah. So it started off with, so this is a continuation of Podcasting 101. So last week I talked about when you record your file, um, you got like a, an, a, like an audio file that was is your beautiful podcast and you're trying to figure out where to store it and where to ho- where So storing, hosting, saving, editing, all those things. Um, you So here's the free route. Okay. Now, you might have to rent a couple of microphones just to make the sound a little bit better. You can do that for like pennies at Long McQuaid. Yeah. Um, not a paid sponsor, but I love them. They're fantastic. So once you, like you can host your pod, your podcast on Spotify for podcasters for zero dollars. Doesn't cost anything. Doesn't cost anything. There's also YouTube podcasts where you can host your podcast for zero dollars. So, okay. So then there's the next level of how do you market? And this goes for publishing books. Like you do... It, it's it's you can trust the universe that because you published a book or a podcast that the right people will find you you just tuck it away on a website and maybe people will find you and that's possible that has not been my experience we've done that where we've just put put books and podcasts out into and cds out into the void of the you know the ether it's just out there people yep. could find it they could find it it is a is a service to yourself to market your own things. Like if you believed in it enough to do the thing, love yourself enough to market it and let people know that it's there. It's not, you don't need to be pushy. You can be if you want to, it helps. But it helps to believe in yourself enough to say, do you even know I wrote a book? Do you even know that I do this thing? Like yep. it's it's a big, it's a big. And I know that one of, one of your biggest hangups for a long time was like, I don't want to keep posting on my Facebook page or on my my business page or whatever, because the people that are following me or that see this stuff, they're going to get sick of it and they're going to unfollow or whatever, whatever the (laughs) the next step is. But it was like, I feel like for a long time you were like, I don't want to keep posting. I don't want to keep marketing myself because people are getting sick of it. I don't know that everybody's seeing it and everybody's tired of seeing it. But then we go out and we talk to somebody and they're like, I had no idea you were doing a podcast. It was like, how are you not seeing all of the posts? So, and I think, I don't know that I ever had so many posts that it irritated people. I would post once and immediately feel like... I'm I'm driving everybody crazy. I wanted to message everybody on my (laughs) friends list and say, are you mad at me? I'm really sorry. I'm sorry. (laughs) And it became like, oh my God. So, it it was necessary. It was a necessary... So, in the journey of let's do a podcast. Now, we started the podcast before we were ready. We Josh set up the microphones down here in the in the room. I was just was setting like, everything up as out. a test, and we just sat down. Just and did sat down forty minutes. Yep. And so the rule, the, the rules that I'm seeing, not rules, but the guidelines or the recommendations or the advice. And this is not coming from business school. I, I my business professors are like, Vicky, shut up, don't tell people that. Really, because it's not what I learned in school. Start before you're ready. You can figure stuff out along the way. And if you need to change details along the way, that's okay. But the work, the 
hurdle or the obstacle hurdle of getting started won't be done. When I was learning cursive in grade four, the, th- the sentence we had to write over and over it was once begun, you're half done. And I was like, this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. What the hell does that mean? <laughs> and it means that the biggest, yeah, I mean, I don't mean to, I don't mean to Vicky explain it, but it's the, the biggest hurdle is getting started. And so you don't need to know all the things. Like if you want to start a business or start a, if you're an entrepreneur and people are called entrepreneurship, some people are happy going to an office every day and working for other people. That's awesome. There are other people who are really called to be a business owner yep. because maybe they want to make more money than the hourly salary that someone has agreed is all you're worth. Because when you're an entrepreneur, you can starve to death, but you can also, there's no cap on how much you can make. You pay yep. taxes on it, but there's no cap when you're an entrepreneur. And that creative control really appeals to me so um not having to go to a boss and ask for a raise you can just do your own you can work harder you can do more work or more things like there are solutions to these problems like you can do something a little bit differently to make more money you can scale your business and so in the journey in the podcasting journey we did start uh even though we had experience before this one we had been talking about for quite some time yeah and would probably have took a few more months really to to, to get started and it was like well just what if we just set the thing up first well what if we just put the microphone see if it'll work see so we got this this is not a real library did you know that that's a backdrop um <laughs> we got that because the wall behind is just an unfinished basement wall and uh we just step by step did the little things like one little thing at a time and then eventually it was like uh, well the microphones are on the camera's on why don't we so and then you you put the pieces in place after so in marketing a podcast and putting it in front of people who might enjoy it and benefit from what we have to say. And that takes, that already is churning in me like, oh my God, who do you think you are? But. Which goes for anybody. If you don't tell anybody that you have a podcast, you might as well not do it. Like let people know. It's actually a service to let people know about these gifts that you have to offer because there's a person out there that would benefit from it and they're not hearing it because you're not putting it out there it's a service and i've seen that from you know those inspirational seminars and those you know find your whatever find your best self like it's a service if you make the best coffee in the whole country like if you i um if you have like if you bring in coffee beans from a certain place and you figured out how to brew the best cup of coffee but you don't want to market it like it's a service there are people out there who want an excellent cup of coffee i don't drink coffee but if there's a, you're providing a service to let people know what you're yeah. doing. So anyway, along that same theory or philosophy, uh, the journey with the podcast has been, uh, all the advice has been to make sure you have a website and show notes. And I'm like, well, there's a transcript of the podcast. And I, I question all these things like, well, this seems a bit stupid, but the transcript is not searchable. So all these things we talk about, we we type out a transcript because it, it's accessible and we want people to uh, be able to follow along just in case they have a, so we um, have a captions, disability. So we have captions on the video, on YouTube yeah. at least, because they have an option to put a captions file on there. So anybody that can't hear mm-hmm. it can watch the captions. And... You can go, YouTube will automatically put captions on there, but the accuracy rate is like one in three words is incorrect. So so we put captions on there, and but they're not searchable. So even if I said something in a podcast and I want to go back and see where I, where I said that thing, you can't search within the captions. So doing show notes. And so the reason I started a Shopify account is not was not originally to sell. It was because I found out you can put a blog on Shopify, yeah, where you post your show notes and you can embed your podcast. So we have a page on our selfpublishednl.com website. There's a page on there for the Are You Mad at Me podcast. And With show gonna, notes. We're gonna, so we have for we, each episode. It's, it's the highlights of all the episodes yeah. and it's searchable. And so it shows up on Google. It's, it's search engine optimization. So that's, I, I don't like these words. These are words that shut me down and I go, what? But I'm facing eyes into it. And so in in figuring out how to let people know we were making this podcast, I so Shopify, not a sponsor. I'm just telling you that there's a deal going on right now um, where you can pay, you can get Shopify for a dollar a month for the first three months. And you can cancel at any time. So you can try a Shopify website and you do a blog. You can put your podcast on there. You don't have to sell anything if you don't want to, but I mean, if you have a product that you're selling, this is this is a good this is a spot. It's an e-commerce website, so you put your pod, you start your blog on Shopify. It's a dollar a month for the first three months. So from now till March, it's costing me a dollar to have our website. 
We have our own domain that was like on GoDaddy. I think we paid like 30 bucks for that. Something like that. But we have our own domain. We went to Shopify and it's a big learning curve. But if I'm able to do it and I'm 47, anybody can do it. Uh, there was a, there was a, some, some points during the last couple of weeks when you were setting it up that it was difficult. Oh but, my God. F- horrifying. Uh, Cause it's a brand new thing. Like any, anytime you're doing a brand new thing like that, mm-hmm. but now it's, it's self-published in L.com. So, but what was horrifying before that was uh, publishing. Yep. I didn't know how to do any of that stuff. And I wanted to publish a book and I had no money. So I was like, well, how do I possibly, without paying an editor, without paying whatever, without paying a vanity press, $5,000 to send me a hundred copies of my book. And, and they don't really, they're not, it's, it's a free market. It's a free market society. So you're entitled to spend your money wherever you want. But I would like to know what I'm asking for. I would like to know the language of the people that are doing the work so I can say, I need this formatted or I need this. I need a graphic designer to put a cover together. And like some things are so intimidating. Graphic designers, that must be thousands of dollars. No, it's not. There are also templates you can use to make your book cover. You don't need, there are so, there are things you can do. And there's, of course, with DIY, you can, do it all your 100% yourself, or you can learn how to do it and ask and then hire other people, or you just straight out hire other people to do it. So, but those are all things that you still retain so much creative control because you're self-publishing. And, and I'm was a firm believer in you, self-publishing. You were talking about editing and stuff like having, like if you went to a publisher, they would <clears throat> probably assign you an editor and they would make changes yeah. to your book or suggest changes or whatever. And that would be what would need to happen to get your book published. But with a, uh, when you're self-publishing, if you're editing it yourself, which can be a little bit dangerous because you need another set of eyes on it, usually, to just have a fresh look. But or you, you can take a break and step away from it for a month yep. and look at it with fresh eyes after you haven't been into it for a month. Like, after you've been away having, from it, you ha- go back and read it fresh. Having a friend to edit it, hiring somebody to edit it, whatever you decide to do if you're self-publishing. But the, it comes down to your decision. Yeah. So you you can yeah. say, well, no, I don't, I don't, I wanted it to sound like this, or I, I would prefer it to sound like this, or... And then you make the decision before it goes to press, before you upload it to KDP or wherever you're going to do your self-publishing, and it's your decision. Yep. So it's not like our corporate overlords at the publishing company need right. to need to have the final say. No, it's right. your final say. It's your book. It's your creativity. It's your, like if you went, if you were a painter, you wouldn't want somebody over your shoulder going, "I'm, I'm not going to sell this unless you change this color a little bit, this shade, or the, this tree needs to be taller, or whatever." Like mm-hmm. if it's it's your Creation. It's your art, your creation. Yeah. So, and I think running it, like imagining that your book is a company. You're running it like a small business. It's it's a product you've created. Obviously, you have something to say that's important and you deserve to tell it. Your story's important. And I think everybody has at least one book in them. I really believe that. And I felt the same way when I was doing community television. Everybody has something they want to share. They have a story that's worth telling. And giving people a platform to do that is, I feel like, my life's calling. I just love making documentaries about about people, about their stories, and like doing legacy videos of like, before someone passes away, like leave, preserve their story, you know, like yeah. it just, all of it, it, it's all under the umbrella of self-publishing we, because it's <laughs> yourself publishing it, you know? We've done, we've done documentaries and we did a documentary on accessibility and I remember hearing people tell story, it was how to fail at accessibility. So it was a lot of, a lot of horror stories about like, I couldn't do this or this wasn't available to me or whatever. And there was a lot of really serious and these stories were can be kind of bad. And I remember filming and interviewing these people and being like, this is so great. Like, <laughs> and it, I'm sure it came across as somebody telling me a horror story about something yeah. terrible that happened to them. And I'm like, I love this. But it was like, no, this is going to this is going to make really the stories sounds awful. And I'm sorry that happened to you. But man, this is make this is really good in your life like people want to hear what you went through and what like because they can relate to it and they can see that they're not alone because they like it was just it's really great to hear people's really innermost stories come out and so i think there's an art form to that i think like just like a painting when you want it to look just so when you finish your book and you want it to be exactly the way you want it i think when you're making a documentary being able to pull that story or have a, have a person articulate something that you know is going to impact people and connect with people and they've just told their story in such a way that you're moved by it behind the camera. Yeah. That's a magical creative moment. Like you're not telling the story but you per- facilitated you set up the camera and you got a good shot and you put lighting on their faces so they're so you can actually see who they are. Like that's a creative you know, that's a beautiful creative thing that happens. And it's music is the same. All of it is when you hit that that frequency of 
that's the thing that's going to connect you with people. That's going to resonate. And you feel it in the room. You yeah. feel it when when you hit that sweet spot and someone's like, yeah, you just, people are going to start crying right there because I just <laughs> yeah. started crying. And it's a beautiful, uh, it's a beautiful process. Um, how are we doing on time? Uh, hour and 15 minutes. I don't want to go off on another Ish. tangent if it's going to take a long time. So I'm going to go back to something that I, we were just talking about with having an editor uh, pull apart your work. So uh, a few years ago, right around this time, I wrote an article for CBC. Yeah. So I originally, how did I end up in there? So they actually, they did a story about my first book, They uh, For the Grace of Joe. They did a story about women who had lost babies back in here in St. John's. And of course, I'm from Newfoundland, but I was in Maine at the time. And they included me in the story. And so in the course of the conversation with the interviewer, um, I mentioned uh, that I had why was I? Yeah. So I gave her a copy of my book. She brought it back to the station um, and gave it to her producer who uh, I had a conversation with and he liked my voice. So we were just having, we were just chatting or whatever. And he was saying, how's it been since you moved back to Newfoundland? And I said, oh man, I'm so happy to be home. Um, I, I'm i never leaving. I'm never leaving. I will starve here before I live anywhere else. And he said, you should write that down. <laughs> and I said, nobody, who would like, who would possibly want to hear what's going on for me this Christmas? It was about six years ago. And so I thought about it, went away, and I was like, no, that's ridiculous. And so we'd, we had a few more conversations, and he'd say, have you written that article yet? And I'd say, no, nobody wants to hear that somebody's having a hard time. Everybody's having a hard time. And who cares about my story? So eventually, I would, I, he said, Eventually, during a few conversations, I, I he said, that's your voice right there. He said, you're sardonic and you're sarcastic, and that's the voice that you should write with. And so I did write the article, and it was five pages or something like that. And they, I sent it over. He said, the people in the newsroom read it, uh, the, you know, all the editors or whatever. He said, it's such, they love it. They absolutely love it. I'm going to assign you an editor. And I was, I didn't think much of it because it had never happened before. I'd written other stuff for magazines and, and for news places and I'd never been assigned an editor, but this was a POV, this is a point of view piece. So they assigned me an editor. And I remember being on a, being in, on, on like the fourth or fifth call uh, where this person had found something in my story that she needed clarification on or didn't like. So I had said something about, um, um, I said stuff about Salvation Army. It was very complimentary, but I had said something about, um, there was a couple of different things in there that she didn't like. I said something about coming across the border and there was something about guns in there. Um, and she was like, we can't put that in. That's too, people won't understand what that is. And I was like, well, this is how I talk though. And if you don't, <laughs> like people do understand that people who know me would understand this story and some probably a few other people, but she didn't understand it. So she was pulling all these things from my story. And after the fifth call, I remember exactly where I was. I was in a parking lot, sitting in the passenger side. We were, it, <laughs> Henry had stitches in his foot and we were at the health clinic getting a kit to remove <laughs> the stitches at home. And I was sitting in the parking lot listening to this editor from CBC saying, we need to take this part out. We need to take this part out. And I just finally went, you know what? I don't want to take that part out. She said, well, it doesn't meet our standards. And I said, okay, so here's the deal. If you need to cut that, if, if you need to cut the whole thing, Cut the whole thing. Forget but it. this story is going in with this detail. Right. Because this is more, my story. It's your story. Yeah, it's your voice. It became, her, it became hers. It became like how she spoke. And I, I don't write like that. And, and like you said, the, the editor, not the editor, but the, the the guy that was in charge that asked you to do it in loved the first it. place. He said they that loved voice, it. Wanted your voice. Yeah. And that was getting... But looking back at the article, like the stuff that she was changing sounded like her. And she was taking my voice out of it. So it, it got to a point where I said, if you need to cut the whole thing, that's okay. And she said, "I'm so, excuse, I'm sorry. I, I'm not understanding. <laughs> Are you telling me to kill the article if I can't put this part in?" I said, "Yes." It got in, went viral. It was the most read story that week on CBC. People went nuts, not in a good way. People were sharing it like, "Look at this loser." This actually happened. <laughs> the comment section was insane, insanity. Get a job, wash your problem, your poor, your poor kids, go back to school. <laughs> like, I have five diplomas, but whatever. And I had them at that point. But it was like the the, vit the the vile stuff that came at us. But there was also a thread of people who it really resonated with who reached out and said, we've had tough times too. 
Um, it was about a, it was a Christmas article about having a tough time in Newfoundland because we had just gotten home. We were artistic people. We wanted to live creatively, and it was a really tough time. And so that's what the article was about. Was like all the goofy stuff that happened because we were. We were just fine in our footing. Right. We're in a different place right now because we know what we want to be doing and we're figuring out how to do it. So it's a different, it's a different kind of. Yeah, we got a few years under our belt at this point. Yeah, and we know what direction we're going in. But that story was uh, it resonated because I hit the sweet spot. I hit what I want. Like I hit who I am as a person, and it resonated with people. And of course, just because people were mad at me, that actually tells me that it resonated with them in a way. Yeah, that's it. That, made them uncomfortable. It's a response. So there was a whole lot of people like the, the editor, the, the producer at CBC called me to see if I was OK. <laughs> and he said, I like and I thought he was calling to say we should take the article down. He's like, no, no, we love it. It's going wild. Uh, but we just want to check and make sure you're OK. And so after that, they changed their policy because at the time, if you wrote an article, they would put your email address <laughs> so they could contact you. So people, the general public could contact you. They changed the policy after that. That has happened a few times in my life where they change policies because of uh, something that <laughs> happened. But anyway, they no longer put contact emails on CBC articles because of me, because there was so many people. Um, should I tell that story? Should I tell the st- this- why that happened? <laughs> I got an email. Yeah. Yeah. You sure? Go nuts. It's I got an- story. I got an email on Christmas Eve. It was so the article came out around the middle of December. And right. so a lot of people got a lot of emails, a lot of really angry comments, all the things. People were calling me saying, did you read the comments? Did you see what that person said? And like, I no, I purposely didn't read the comments after the first three or four. And uh, so this guy emailed me directly on Christmas Eve. We, just a reader, just a random just a like random guy. So this was six years ago. So our kids were uh, seven and four, four Christmas Eve. OK, there's a little bit going on Christmas Eve. And this guy wrote me an email and said, you should be ashamed of yourself. My mother worked her ass off to become a doctor to support me. And you should be ashamed of yourself. You should be taking better care of your kids. Maybe you should go back to school. I I did not react well to that. And I sent him back a colorful lead languaged email. I didn't give it 24 hours. I wrote back immediately. (laughs) Because I I didn't want to write back Christmas Day. (laughs) That'd be cruel. So I wrote him on, back. You don't work on Christmas. So I wrote him, <laughs> I wrote him back on Christmas Eve, and a short time later, I heard from CBC from the ombudsman, I, and uh, the guy had, he had written to me, to tell me I should be ashamed of myself, and I responded because he was just writing to me as a private citizen. But apparently, if you've written for CBC, you become a spokesperson for CBC. And when this guy got in touch with the ombudsman in Halifax, who got in touch with the producers up there, who got in touch with the producers here in Newfoundland, and I got called in to a room, and we were like, Vicky, um, you probably shouldn't have written back to that guy. And I was like, but he wrote to me directly. And they were like, yeah, but you might not have, you shouldn't have used the language that you used. And I was like, am I in trouble here? And like, no, not at all. We love how much, how many clicks your article got. We love what you did. We're, and you're going to write for us again. Just, we just want you to know, maybe don't write with so many swear words. Wasn't not, it? not quite so colorful if you're responding to a reader in the future. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that was a good, uh, you handled it. So I'm reminded of another story. <laughs> <laughs> this is the, uh, speaking of, ask me anything and nobody's asking me any questions, but I'm just going to ramble. Because we're into that sweet spot of it's after an hour and uh, people have probably stopped listening by now. So this no, is this people is, are on the edge of their seats. I don't know. Anyway, you would have thought that I learned my lesson <laughs> from that experience, right? I didn't. So I had another job that I was completely unqualified for just last year. This year, 2024. There was a posting last year on this for the city where they were looking for a fiddle instructor. Now, full disclosure... I own a fiddle, and I've had one for about 25 years. And you've played it on stage. Yeah, recently. Yeah. But when I say I, I own a fiddle, that I own a, I own a fiddle for 25 years. I, I, for, I learned how to play a song 25 years ago, and I left it. Maybe it's not that long. No, it's only 20. To be fair, it's only 20 years. So there was a posting. I had taken some lessons with the best fiddle player in the province. I He just got the Order of Canada. I don't know if that was for fiddle playing, but... He's he's amazing. And I took lessons with him. And he showed me like very easy to understand uh, notation, finger positions, all that stuff. So when I saw a job posting with the city for a fiddle instructor, 
and having a master's degree in adult education, I thought. I, mean, I just want to point out that this far in the story, you've, you've said fiddle several times. You have not said violin once. No. And this is, <clears throat> Cause it's this is germane to the It is the, the same <laughs> instrument, but it's played differently. So violin, you're going to go to the, you're going to use the Suzuki method. You're going to play with the Newfoundland Symphony Orchestra. You're going to learn really technical, lots of sheet music, lots of all what this notation means. With traditional fiddle, it's, you, here's where your finger goes. Here's where your finger goes. Here's how to move the bow. It's fiddle. It's traditional music. It should be shared in a kitchen. So I learned trad fiddle. So I offered, they were looking for a fiddle instructor. And so did they, it was for fiddle, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I got in touch and they were very excited and they called and they wanted to talk to me. And um, it turns out that the enthusiasm was because they had not received any other applications for the job. So they were thrilled that someone Which is not a direct comment up. on your skill or abilities as a teacher or a fiddle player. Technically, no, but also just a fact, also just germane a to the story fact. is uh, I'm not qualified to do this. But anyway, I'm plowing forward. They they like, you know, I have a nice personality. They thought I had a nice personality. So they these were people that were around the same constructive interference wavelength, okay? That we, we joined forces. These are the other people working power. for the city. Yeah. Yeah. Lovely people at the HR department. So we're going through the interview process. I'm put. They put me in touch with this person and this person. I'm doing all these levels of interviews. And at one point, I say to them, uh, "Do I need to play for you guys? Like, are you guys gonna give me like, do I have to audition kind of thing for this fiddle job?" And they were like, "No." They, none of these. None of these city employees were musicians. None of them. No. No. So, okay. So <laughs> here's the thing. When I sent in my application, I sent in a music video from Mulberry Creek for a song that was the very first song we ever released called Garden Party. And there is an absolutely killer fiddle part in it. I mean, it is amazing. You might hear it at the beginning and the end of this very podcast because we use it it's for our It's amazing. Theme song. And that is by the very talented Kendall Carson, not me. And when we shot the video for it, I had a fiddle in my hands. So I may or may not, but definitely did, send the city the video where that awesome fiddle part is playing and I have a fiddle in my hands. I in no way, shape or form can play that part. I don't know if I'll ever be able to play that part. It's <laughs> awesome. It's really, really cool. It's just a video that we happen to make. So. Unrelated. I got hired as a fiddle instructor. They were very excited. I also taught guitar, which I'm qualified to do because I've been playing since I was nine. Fiddle, not so much. But I did know how to play three solid Newfoundland tunes. And you're a very good teacher. I mean, I can teach tuning and I can teach form and uh, and that stuff. Like that was down pat. Yeah. And the three songs, I can play those three songs. We've played those at shows. Uh, we've done those on pub big stages, uh, and it's fine. Yep. So I knew how to get people through twelve weeks of lessons where they learn three traditional Newfoundland songs. So we get in there, and the first day, this lady walks in and she goes, "Ugh, I hate Newfoundland music." In the, in a fiddle class. Yep. In front of five other people playing fiddle who are you know much advanced years like beyond you know have had their fiddle under their bed for a long time uh have, have, and their th what's that twilight years want to learn a new thing in their twi <laughs> literally the, the autumn of there their was lives. not a hair with color to be seen it was all white hair except for this one lady and she said so she hated newfoundland music and then another few minutes into the class she goes oh i hate fiddle i'm sorry what Ugh, my son has taken lessons Ugh, I hate the sound of it. it. Oh, the squeaking. I can't stand it. And I said, why are you here? And she said, oh, because they're teaching them the Suzuki method and uh, they want me to help them practice at home. And they thought it'd be a good idea for me to take some lessons so I understand fiddle better. And it's not fiddle. She's, her son has learned a violin. It got worse from there. She was very disruptive, very disrespectful, very mean. Like not a good student. I started to have panic attacks going in before I would teach the class. Like I was so, really having trouble teaching the class. I just want to say like teaching adults and teaching people that, <clears throat> so when you're teaching like elementary school, middle school, high school, they have to be there. Like past elementary school, because those kids are usually pretty sweet and still happy to be there and stuff. But when you get into middle school and high school, it's like, we're being forced to be here. We don't want to be here. We're going to make your life hell, teacher. Mm -hmm. And then when you get into like, college, university, adult learning, like uh, enrichment classes like this one, 
people are mostly doing that stuff because they want to be <laughs> because they're like they're paying for it because they want to do something new they want to learn something new so usually it's like enthusiastic what learners. can you teach me i'm gonna sit here and listen and i'm gonna enjoy learning this new hobby program thing that i'm that i'm here to learn and just taking like they're usually really grateful and can, taking it in and enjoying what you're giving them. So this is exactly why I did a master's in adult education and not K to 12, because I couldn't teach kids. If you, there's not an amount of money you could give me to teach kids. I, just, I mean, unless it's like in an enrichment and program or like an kids, after school. It's but not usually the kids fault. No, it's, it's like that they're, they're forced to be there. They're forced to be there. It's yeah. a public school system. It's yeah. That's a whole other episode. That's a whole other. That's So adult learning is the sweet spot for me, where it's like they're going to be enthusiastic and they're eager to learn. They are harder to teach because they have they bring in all their suitcases. They're all their baggage is sitting next to them. Yeah. And they've got these problems outside of, of the class. And they they're, they're car trouble and money trouble and whatever's going on in their life you yeah. have to get past all of that you have to find a way to get them in the room to to open their you know to open their learning you know to open and their And most minds. of the students that you had in the guitar and the fiddle class were were open and willing all of them and every single and... one of them and so and I, I i have like when i when i teach classes or when i teach workshops or when i do one-on-one -on -one consultations i do take the first couple of minutes to like breathe visualize imagine your best outcome like we i get do on the that. right frequency yeah Right. So I did that in this class. But this lady was like, I'd say, OK, let's everybody take a deep breath. Close your eyes for a second. Take a deep breath. And I look over and her eyes were like wide open. I'm like, OK, she's not participating. <laughs> so it went on for a few weeks where she was getting more and more angry and did not like she didn't like the tread, uh, the traditional um, fundamentals of things being passed on by ear by playing for each other not and she was like well what does this thing mean like i don't know it means stop playing that note there and she's like well that means a full rest or a, and i know music notation i just don't have any interest in it I, I i glaze over it's like math or accounting i know it i just don't care to think about it so she was like well this is not what my son is getting at home from uh this and she named the teacher and i it's a person i didn't really care for and i was like maybe you'd be better off to take lessons from her she's from saskatchewan go take it from her <laughs> <laughs> um, I really couldn't care less about her issues. Like she wasn't participating anyway. Right. So it got to a point where, um, she wanted to, she came in and she asked if she could take video of me playing a song because she had never heard Saltwater Joys. And I'm like, you know, you already are giving me a pretty good impression. You don't like me very much. I don't know that I want to give you a video of me <laughs> to what? Mm -hmm. Go make fun of me, show it to your friends and make fun of me. I don't know. I was pretty insecure. So I went, uh, no, no, I don't want you to take video. I, I'm really not comfortable. I said, I'll send you, a, a, like, I'll, I'll play it for you and I'll send you a track of it after. <clears throat> so I get home. By the time I get home, there's already an email um, saying, where's the video? Or where's the, where's the recording? I'm like, okay. So just as a side note, I went and looked her up on Facebook and found out that she had posted a picture of the sheet music I had provided that was provided to me by the best fiddle instructor in probably the country and she had posted does anybody know uh what this should look like this makes my brain hurt i was f furious i was so mad because she tagged a whole bunch of city councilors <laughs> a whole bunch of professionals a whole bunch of musicians that i'm friends with and they all knew i was teaching the class it was embarrassing so i wrote back to her and said I don't think I'm going to be doing a recording for you. You've told me that you hate Newfoundland music and you hate the fiddle. So I'm thinking that maybe you should ask for a refund. Maybe this class. class isn't for you. Maybe this isn't for you. And because you have created such a hostile environment where I'm trying to teach other really nice adults to play a few Newfoundland tunes, I would appreciate it if you didn't come back. Well, this hit the fan. She went straight to three levels of management because I had emailed her back. She emailed me at home, and I emailed her back. So I got pulled into the office for a two-hour session. But the first one was two hours. Uh, Vicky, you probably shouldn't have emailed this person back. And I was like, well, she's emailing me outside of class privately. So it seems like, yeah, but you told her not to come back. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. And? You're like, well, you know, uh, you, you can't do that. I'm like, I'm pretty sure I can. There's She's disrupting a class for five other paying customers. Like, can't you just give her a refund? Like, yeah, um... 
Yeah, no, you can't. As a, as an employee of the city, you're not entitled to write back to somebody who is abusing you and <laughs> harassing you and dis, and dis, yeah. and slandering, disparaging you publicly on social media. Um, you you can't do that. And so there was a, not, a lot of meetings. She said she didn't mean to do that. She didn't mean to hurt my feelings, but insisted on coming back to the class. She had to be there for some reason. They called me back in and they were like, okay, we talked to her. She promises to never do it again. We're going to send somebody in to supervise the class from now on. Will you, will you keep teaching? Because you have 19, 17 students or whatever. And I went, no, not if she's going to be there. So this is where my personality comes out. Like this might sound like if you're tuning in right now, you're going to go, man, she has a terrible personality. She's probably ornery and hard to work with. Like it was weeks and weeks and weeks of being abused by this woman in the class. Yeah. And so I said, no, I'm setting my boundary. I'm in here doing a fun thing, bringing what I know to the table. I know how to teach adults. I don't know how to protect myself from abuse and harassment in a, in a, in a safe setting. There's all these policies about not being abusive to employees of the city. As an employee, <laughs> I thought I'm entitled, but apparently you cannot put up your hand and say, uh, this is abusive. Can this, can you stop this? There has to be a whole thing. There yeah. has to be a, I don't know how I put a, could have possibly gotten out of that. But anyway, she insisted on coming back to the class. And so all 17 people. So the, did the, not have any further classes to tie that back to, uh, the CBC article. Which... So actually, I'm going to finish that. Sto- I'm going to I'm going to tack onto that story. Almost all the people who were in those classes did sign up when I started teaching privately, and we had a great time, and they were awesome. And I because I'm a, because as a small business, as an entrepreneur, I was able to pick and choose yeah. who came to the class, and there's no. I want to create a safe environment for people. When people are in my room, I do not want anyone to feel uncomfortable, like the parents are fighting in the kitchen and they got to, you know, duck down. Like, I don't want anyone to feel like that ever. So uh, being in, in control in that way, I'm safe. My clients are safe. And people that are coming in with bad intentions get nowhere near us. And it's I took, your, I took down. your private fiddle lesson and I was one of the students in the group class and it was fantastic. Oh, I learned how to play... You. um Muscles in the Muscles corner. In the, corner. Mm. the fiddle is a beautiful instrument and I really do love it and I've been doing a lot more practice and I've, I I, I know I set it up as I wasn't qualified and all that stuff but I mean I'm qualified to play a few songs and there, but there was player. to be fair there was a lot of stuff I really didn't know but I wasn't that wasn't going to be covered in the intro class. Yeah. I couldn't do an advanced class or an intermediate class but I could teach beginner fiddle um, comfortably So and having safer. somebody call you out on your insecurities every I class. remember her asking <laughs> how did you even get this job? She asked me privately, one-on-one, how did you get this job anyway? And I said, well, I have a master's and I play fiddle and I'm in a band. I'm on the radio. And then when class started, she asked in front of the whole class. And I just thought, why, we just, why are you doing this? Why are you doing that to me? Like, what, what, is, your, what is your goal here? Like, why would, you, why would you try to hurt the instructor? Like, yeah. I know something you want to know. Why would you attack me and call me? At, like, not that it was a secret. It wasn't, I mean... I didn't do an audition for it, but I knew how to play the songs. But I being put on the spot like that, I was not prepared for that. And, you know, next time around, when I taught privately, it's not an issue. When I teach privately now, it's fine. I just, it's this, the th- common thread being uh, you can't email people. Just like self-publishing, there's a whole lot of stuff you can't do when you have a contract, was, if you get a contract with a publisher. That was five years Six. apart. But what? Those two, those two those incidents two with, the, with the man and CBC article and the city... Lady fiddle, the city. fiddle class. Those were okay. I have one more story, and then we're going to end the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> a few months pass, and I have a, have opportunity to uh, work on a municipal election. And I'm driving around the city where I'm. A, I'm what, we, what was it? A driver that day for the election, and I happened to be in a city vehicle with another city employee, and. He says, so what do you do with the city? And I said, um, fiddle instructor. And I hadn't been a fiddle instructor for months at that, but I was very embarrassed. And so later in the day, I say, okay, look, I got to tell you, I'm not a fiddle instructor anymore with the city. I actually don't work with the city. I just had signed up for this, you know, months ago, and they just kept me on to do the election part. And he said, yeah, I knew that. I'm like, what? How did you? And he was like, oh, I heard about you. Mm -hmm. I said, what did you hear? And he said, I just heard that there was a problem with a student. And that we lost an instructor. And I said, and he was like, now it wasn't anything about you. As an instructor, he said, I heard that the story was about a student. So he's driving down Kimmont Road. And I'm like, I start, he was asking what happened and stuff. And I'm telling the story. And I mentioned the person's name. And I'm, 
no exaggeration, he swerved. He went, <laughs> what? Did you just, what? She was a legend. He said, if you knew how many emails my department gets from her every single week complaining about the state of the parks, the state of the bathrooms, the state of the slides, the state of the swings, her kids isn't, or can't rent skis for long enough, uh, she complains. He said, she... I found a sandwich on the ground in the park and it had mayonnaise on it. And I don't like mayonnaise. <laughs> <laughs> That's from Parks and Recreation. Oh my God. But it was like, it was such a validating moment of, vindication it wasn't it. just me. Well, not vindication because I didn't get back at her. Like, well, it, but, but it was you validating. Val- you validated. It was, yeah. yeah. So, sorry, I just corrected you. You're, are you mad at me? <laughs> 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 but it was a moment of like, oh my God, this person probably has something going on that I hope her life got better. I really do. But it was such a moment of, oh, it really, I had been carrying that for months. Like, You know one way to make your life better? Learning an instrument. <laughs> and to, to get away from that, like to forget that fundamental of the mental health benefits of learning an instrument and being around other people who are learning together. It's such a beautiful thing. Yeah. That's why I love teaching. Fun in your I life. love it. I love giving people, like, here's a thing you couldn't do before. It can change someone's life. Yep. Like you teach somebody 100%. a skill, like if it's basket weaving, that person could be, they could go start a business weaving baskets and they could get out of an abusive relationship because they can support themselves with this new adult skill, like with this new, uh, like adult learning is a beautiful, K to 12 is a lot of, a lot of honorable people teaching K to 12, but man, adults is where it's at because you have this, uh, like you have this opportunity to help somebody. And yeah. it might it might be just something that makes them happy for a week, or it make it can change their life. Publishing a book, or or learning how to write a song, or record a song, or start a podcast where people connect with your story, like it's amazing. Like what an honor to be able to do that. And so anything that takes that away from me, like to distract me from the honorable, from the amazing experience, yeah, that's not fair to me. And it's certainly not fair to the other people in the room who are not getting my best because I do, you know. I'm okay at that stuff. I'm pretty like I think I I think that's my calling is to not necessarily publish for other people or or write songs or or produce for other people. I mean, or any of those things. I think my gift is showing other people how to do it, empowering yeah. other people, empowering and encouraging and support. Yeah, that's yeah. You're really and I love when I remember when people have done that for me. I can tell you the teachers that I've had over the years that just opened my world because they gave me a chance and they saw me and they they you know like they saw the real me. And I know Vicky's not going to do this, so I'm going to do it one more time. She worked really hard on our, our website that has all of our stuff on it, all the books and the videos, the films and the CD and the podcast information. Selfpublishednl.com is where Vicky put all of her heart for the past couple of weeks making the website, and it's awesome. And it's a way for us to share the stuff that we love and that feels good and that we're doing to help us feel better and hopefully help somebody else feel better at the same time. So I think you did a great job on the website and I think people should be able to check it out. And so it does published in and it, it really all started because there was a place to host the podcast, like to put a place where we could put show notes and we could do a blog and I could write articles about whatever is going on or whatever I want to like later. So there'll be tutorials on there like in, in the new year we're we have it all scripted out already it's there's going to be step-by-step instructions on how to self-publish you can also hire us i mean we'll do it for you or we'll show you how to do it but like if you want to do it by yourself it's hard some of the stuff is hard well why should you have to do the hard work if i've already done it why can't i just show you how to do it right and say look you don't have to go do a thousand google searches here's how you use the template here's how you get an isbn here's how to market your book here's how to do a video promo and stuff is so easy when you have some like when you know what you need then you can ask the right questions yep. and you can find the right resources and that's what i want to be for people i want to be sometimes what i wish we had known you know yeah. the people yeah, we had for sure I w- people i wish we had met along the way because yep. having a couple of published books is um you know, they're my stories and I'm working on a third one right now. So like this is, and I have actually, there's two that I'm working on right now. One's a kid's book and one's an, uh, but it's like now that I've done it, it's just, it's a, that floodgate opens and it's like, oh, I probably have a few more books in me, but everybody's got at least one, whether yeah, you're a poet, whether sure. you're an entrepreneur, whether you make candles or, or, you know, dog bandanas, um, podcasts 
as an entrepreneur, a podcast is a way to reach your clients, reach your customers, let them get to know you. And that's why they're going to buy your dog bandanas. Why would they go to you instead of somebody else? Probably because you make the best bandanas (laughs) of everybody. But when they get to know you, when you actually let people know you and let them in, that's the, that's the connection. And it doesn't matter if you're, uh, it doesn't matter what you're doing. It's when something resonates, when you're actually your authentic self, it matches with this constructive interference of other people who are authentic are going to be drawn to you and it's going to be a magical thing. And so this is a safe space. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not sorry for the emails that I sent because they had it coming. Both of those people had it coming and they started it. As I would say, I grew up in the projects, they started it. Um, But you know, that's, that's where we are. So, so um, um, you're right. So I don't like plugging it, but there is all of our stuff is on there. The, um, it, it really was the but the blogs and the podcast episodes are like the real that's the real sweet spot for me because I get to do this with you, um, and it is really fun and it is like that feeling of I don't want to post this because uh, it might maybe people must be sick of hearing from me now and there are people out there who are so lonely, who are like just dying for this kind of connection with people to find out that they're not alone that they're not the only person feeling sad or feeling. Or feeling creative and not knowing where the hell to put that, like yeah. where to, what to do with that creative energy, because yeah. there is a world out there. And if you're writing a book, you're a writer. If you're thinking about making a documentary film or you record little videos to, to memory, like to, you know, memorialize a, a moment that's happening, like you might be a documentary filmmaker. And if you don't know how to, if you, if someone is telling you, you can't touch that because you're the secretary, ah, uh, that breaks my heart. So anyway, you got me all emotional. There anyway. we go. But at least you're not mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for listening. I'm Vicki Morgan. We should have introduced ourselves off the top. Oh, I have one more story. All right. On my friend's suggestions today on Facebook, Nate Bregetzi's wife <laughs> showed Nate up in my people. Nate Bregetzi's peop- wife came up in your friend's suggestions on Facebook. Came up as someone you might know. <laughs> I mean, that's a sign, right? Like we're one tiny tiny step closer to me performing at Zany's in Nashville. I'm just saying. Put it, put it out there. You think it, you say it out loud, you write it down, and then you put it on your podcast. That's the manifestation formula, right? I think so. I think but the podcast like, is in It there. was like, what? Oh my God. Anyway, um, it was just wild. And, and also, you can see me on the 17th. I'm headlining at Last Minute Comedy um, on the 17th of December, and I'm at Landwash, Laughs at Landwash, the next night in Mount Pearl. So yeah. if you want to come out and check out some comedy, I'm still doing that, and I'm absolutely thrilled. I'm so honored that they asked me, like, headlining. Just just to do a little humble brag there, my first show was the 3rd of July. This year? Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of the same timeline of how long it took us when we met to when we were married. That's true. That's I'm just saying close. that that's pretty close yeah. because we met... Around the same time in July, and we were married by December. So headlining in December, I'm really excited about it. That's um, exciting. That's going to be trust, fun. Don't come know what, out if you're in town. Yeah, come on, check it out. I'm sure we'll be posting clips and stuff on our, uh, on all of our socials and all those yeah. things. But uh, if you're around, yeah, absolutely, we'd love to see you and you know bring your laughing voices and, you know, keep writing. I want to say that. Keep listening. Uh, leave us a review if you like what we're doing. Uh, leave us a review. Yeah, we love rate, the, rate the thing on Shopify, uh, on Spotify. <laughs> Spotify. <laughs> too close. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you can check us out. On, you check out all the other stuff. But it is, so the website is selfpublishednl.com. So you can see the show notes and uh, catch up on stuff that, you know, you maybe missed an episode or whatever. Or if you have show ideas, if you, something you want us to talk about or you have a question or comment, please leave it there for us and we'll certainly share it with our listeners. And we are so grateful to all the people that have listened and supported this. The, the, it's been it's been awesome people yeah. have been so receptive and yeah. uh yeah we're really thrilled with it so keep at it and uh we'll uh i'm vicky morgan and i'm josh morgan and we'll, uh, see, you, see you folks <laughs>